of worship to start. Um, we're glad you all are here. You can't hear? Okay. It's not turned on. Okay. Can you hear me now? I feel like a commercial. <laughs> we're glad all of you are here. We're also glad for those who are watching us on Facebook Live. Uh, today we have a busy afternoon. Um, there's three meetings. At one o'clock, there's Celebrate Recovery Leadership Team is going to meet in the Fellas, uh, Family Life Center Fellowship Hall. At 3.30, the Pastor Parish or SPRC team will be meeting in the conference room back here. And at 5 o'clock, there's going to be a Methodism class in the Family Life Center in the Fellowship Hall. And it's going to be led by Rachel. Um, Elder Bless meets Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 9 to 1 every week. And every Thursday, we have Celebrate Recovery at 6 o'clock. And next Sunday, the Hope Friendship Support Grief, Grief Support Group will meet right after church. And then we'll also have another Methodism class at 5 o'clock in the Family Life Center. Um, we want to remember the Oldendorf family this week, the Travis family, and Donna McRae's family in this time of sorrow. Uh, we're glad that Jilda Holsey and Erica returned safely back from the Holy Land and that Wayne got back, but they've all been sick since they got back. <laughs> um, we also want to remember Kristen Wheelis, who's had some complications from her surgery, and is she out of the hospital? She went home yesterday. Okay, she went home yesterday. And uh, remember Olivia Terrier, she's at home on hospice, and um, remember her family. There's not any more announcements. Hilda's back in the hospital, so I'll be praying for Hilda. She's at UAB? Or St. Vincent's? Okay, she's at St. Vincent's. Okay. Anybody else have anything we need to know about? Okay. Time changes next week. Oh, yes, the time changes next week, so don't forget to set your clocks. It's spring forward, so you're going to lose an hour next week. Is that it? Okay. Here she comes with brain and the light. All right. <laughs> for prayer please gracious Heavenly Father we thank you for all your blessings we are so thankful for your love and support in our lives but your forgiveness and grace are such a wonderful gift please help us to be your light in the world to keep your word in our heart and share your love in a smile an encouraging word a helping hand and a shoulder to cry on Lord be with those who are mourning and comfort them. Put your healing hands on those who are sick and ease their pain. Help us to hear your will for us as we pray and listen in a quiet place for your wisdom. Thank you for all the those who have followed your son Jesus and kept the church alive. Help us to keep the message alive and share it and give us understanding. Open our hearts to you and bless our church and its members. Help us to find ways 
to reach out to our surrounding community. Give us courage to resist temptations and speak up when we see injustice. Be with us as we work together to make our church a blessing to all who come in our doors. These things we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. If you'll all stand, our next hymn is It Is Well With My Soul. <laughs> of Lent, uh, I invite you to remain standing while we say the Psalter, unless you need to sit down. If you're tired, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, we're going to um, do the Psalter and read it responsibly, but there's a sung response, and the choir is going to lead us in that. Um, they'll sing it through, and if you can join in with them when they sing, you're welcome to. It'll be on the, the screen um, so you can see what it looks like. Blessed are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed are those whom the Lord does not hold guilty, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. 
When I did not declare my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. My bones I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave the guilt of my sin. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. <coughs> Shout for joy, you upright in heart. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. Shout for joy, you upright in heart. Therefore, let those who are godly offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of great water shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You encompass me with deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like an unruly horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle. Many are the pains of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy upon you upright in heart. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. Shout for joy, you upright in heart. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. Shout for joy, you upright in heart. Please be seated, and we invite the children to come forward for the children's time. Well, it's a new month, <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to do the children's minute. <laughs> um, how are you guys today? Good. Do you know what, what the church um, observed? We don't say celebrated because it wasn't necessarily a happy thing, but what we observed this past week on Wednesday? Do you guys know what that day is about? <coughs> the beginning of Lent. Did you say something? Dust. dust. What did we do with the dust? We put it on our heads. We mark our foreheads with it. Why would we do that? Do you have any? We remember that God, I can say it. We would remember that God said, you know, from dust we were made and dust we Yeah, that's what we say when we put the dust on the head. We say, from dust you've come, and to dust you'll return. And then we say, repent and the believe in the gospel. Because the season of Lent is the time before Easter. Do you know how many days it is till Easter? A lot. Uh, <laughs> a lot is what she said. It, it's not. It's in April, but it's not April first. Do you know how many days? Well, <laughs> there's 40 days in Lent, but it doesn't count Sunday, so we'd have to do the math to figure it out. But it's somewhere around 40 days. I know it's somewhere around 40 days. She's oh, right. Yes. <laughs> Well, maybe. I don't. <laughs> Somebody can figure the math out for us. But I don't know. I can't do it in my head that fast. So, okay, so the point is there are about 40 days, not including Sundays, until we get to Easter Sunday. And it's during the season of Lent that we do some things differently because it's a time when we remember that we make mistakes, don't we? Do you all make mistakes? Do you do things you shouldn't sometimes? You get in trouble sometimes? Everybody does that, and we call it sin when it's things that God doesn't want us to do. We sin. And so during Lent, we remember that we mess up, but we also remember that God loves us and always forgives us. So I want you to always remember that whenever something happens and you've messed up, remember you can't ever do anything so bad that God won't still love you. Okay, let's say a prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for your love that is always with us. Help us to remember that, even when we mess up. Thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.
Today's scripture lesson comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, the fourth chapter, and I'm reading the first 11 verses. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give to you, if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus walked this lonesome valley. He had to walk it by himself. Oh, nobody else could walk it for him. He had to walk it by himself. must go and stand your trial. You have to stand it by yourself. Oh, nobody else can stand it for you. You have to stand it by yourself. There was a little boy who always went next door to play, even though his mother told him that he shouldn't do that. This worried the mother so badly that she asked him why he was so disobedient. And he replied that Satan tempted him so bad that he just didn't know what to do. So his mom advised him that he should say, get behind me, Satan, and say that whenever he was tempted. And she also built a fence around the yard in the house so that he might not get out of the yard either. Well, that worked for about a week. And then she noticed one sunny afternoon as she looked out the window that there he was over on the neighbor's yard again. 
And so she yelled at him, Jeremiah, what are you doing over there? I didn't I tell you to say, get behind me, Satan, whenever you were tempted? And he said, well, yeah, Mom. I said, get behind me, Satan. And then he went behind me and pushed me through the hole in the fence. <laughs> we're all tempted. And when we hear the story of Jesus' encounter with Satan, I think we can draw courage and strength and find a way to say, get behind me, Satan, and don't push me through the hole in the fence. The passage begins, though, with the word then. It's as if it's following another, uh, another story before it, and it is. It is where we read of Jesus being baptized. He has just been baptized and heard the words, this is my beloved son. And then he's driven out into the wilderness and finds himself tested. What kind of son is he going to be? What kind of Messiah is he going to be? So he is then tempted. And even more than a, a temptation, it's a testing time. These temptations that Jesus experienced were really a test of Jesus' obedience to God and how he would live out what it meant to be a beloved son. What is interesting about this, though, it's one of those stories that when we begin reading this, if we know anything about Jesus, we know how the story's going to end. He's going to be okay. He's going to pass the test. But how does he pass the test? Well, how does he deal with these temptations that he faces? He responds by quoting scripture. All those words in red this time contain words that are in the Old Testament that were the scriptures that Jesus knew. The temptations were responded with scripture. When Jesus quotes God's word to Satan, it is as if the evil disappears. It cannot be upheld. The evil cannot exist in the light of God's word. When we see something in the light of day, when we see its true nature, when we hold something up to God's scrutiny, we can see the truth. As we move through this holy season of Lent, it can be an opportunity for us to hold ourselves up to God's light. So how do we do that? How do we hold ourselves up to the light? And what do we learn about what it means to face temptations from this passage? Perhaps our temptations might also be about our identity. Who are we as children of God? The temptations in our life might challenge our core commitment to God first. Our temptations also help us, though, to engage in the darker places in our lives. The season of Lent is a time to repent, to engage with those places that are the dark corners in our soul that we might dust out and look at. We might examine our lives for the places where we're not as willing to turn our lives over to God, where we want the control. We're to look for the ways that we've been tempted to live lives that are not pleasing to God. These darker places in our lives are where we might spend our time focusing. Lenten season can be a time to really face them, to name it, to understand it, and to seek forgiveness for it. It's not about guilt. It's not about feeling really bad about those things. But it's about the freedom that we receive, knowing that these fears and insecurities have held us, but in God's grace we can be forgiven. We can know a new life, and we can experience a new beginning. Lent offers us the opportunity to encounter Jesus in new ways, in the light of God's love, and to see those dark places in ourselves, to see the places that we call our shadow selves. I believe I've quoted Richard Rohr about this before, but you may not remember. I don't expect you to remember my sermons after you've heard them. But um, <laughs> he, um, he wrote a book called Falling Upward, and it's about the second half of life. And how when we reach the age of 50, we, we 
often make a shift in our spiritual lives if we're truly growing spiritually. And a big part of that is really engaging with the shadow side of our lives. Our shadow self is the part of us that we would rather not see, the part of us that maybe we don't even know is there because we've stuffed down whatever that is so far. Our shadow is what we refuse to see about ourselves and what we don't want other people to see about us. Because most of us have this person that we think we are, that we project out into the world, that we think everybody else sees that person, or you might call it a persona, the mask that we wear in public. That persona is what we show the world, and the stronger that persona is, the more likely we are to not really be engaged with those darker corners of our soul. Spiritual maturity is about learning to see the shadow self, because most of us would rather believe it's not there. But the closer you get to the light, the more you see your shadow. The closer we draw to God, the more places we see that need God within us. And yet, sin and shadow are not the same. I think our shadows can lead us into sin, and that's why it's important to kind of know what's there in the shadows. We're encouraged to avoid sin, though, and because we associate sin with shadow, we're not even willing to look at the shadow because we're worried about what the sin might be then. Perhaps Lent is a good time to allow God's light to illumine those dark places, to engage with the dark corners in your life where perhaps God's light hasn't um, been shining as brightly. And how does Jesus' encounter with Satan help us to do that? Our temptation might be different than Jesus's in some ways, but I think it's also about our identity. Jesus's was about what the Messiahship would look like. What would it mean to be the incarnate God here on earth? What would it mean for his ministry here, his time on earth? Our temptations are not like that, but our temptation is like it in, we're wondering how are we to be the person God has called us to be? How do our temptations lead us away from who God wants us to be? If you think about the culture in which we we live in now, I have to tell you, I am amazed that I can play a silly game on my phone and I will get an advertisement for something I looked at on Amazon on my computer. I mean... But, the, but the, it's the advertisements that are unbelievable that come at us from all kinds of places. You cannot get away from it. But all of them seem to have some message underlying that says, you are not enough. Your teeth aren't white enough. You aren't thin enough. You aren't smart enough. Your hair isn't shiny enough, or you might not have enough hair. <laughs> You're not enough to deserve love or respect, or acceptance. And here's the thing, that is a lie. It's a demonic attempt to steal your identity as a child of God. You are a beloved child of God. And Jesus reminds us that because of that identity, we can find enough in God's grace. Jesus did not die on the cross in order that we would be made acceptable or that God would be made more loving. Rather, Jesus died to show us that God already loves us and has declared that we are just more than just acceptable. We are treasured and priceless. You are treasured and priceless. You are beloved child of God. Satan's encounter with Jesus teaches us that just as Jesus was tempted to be less than who God desired him to be, we can be tempted to be less than who God desires us to be. And when our lives are held up in the light of God's love and grace, then we see the shadows. But nonetheless, God loves us, shadows and all.
And when we can see those shadows in our own lives, when we can see the dark corners that we've been unwilling to engage with and to lay before God, then we can grow spiritually if we will look at those things honestly. There's a Lenten hymn that I've come across the words to. I I don't know the tune, and even if I did know the tune, I I would not sing it. But um, the words are this. To bow in sackcloth and in ashes, or rend the soul, such grief is not Lent's goal. But to be led to where God's glory flashes, his beauty to come near, make clear, make clear, make clear, where truth and light appear. Although we tend to think of Lent as a season when we're really focused on how we fall short, on how we fail and how we don't measure up, Lent is also about grace and the forgiveness that comes. In coming to know and confess the ways that we separate ourselves from God and one another, we also come to know the joy of God's forgiveness, a forgiveness that comes from God alone. In, in the silly joke that I told at the beginning, the little child says, get behind me, Satan, which is actually from a, a different story from the Bible. Um, Martin Luther had a similar strategy, but he used these words from this passage. It's said that when Martin Luther, the great reformer, was facing something whether he felt oppressed by his conscience or plagued by doubt, fear, or insecurity, he would sometimes shout out in defiance, Away with you, Satan! I am baptized! In baptism, you are marked as God's child. And God has promised that through that act of baptism, God will be with you every step of the way. Even when we feel tempted, God is with us. The light of God's love is stronger. It is so much stronger than any darkness or evil that we face in this world. God is with us. Thanks be to God. In the strength of that conviction that God's love is stronger than evil, I invite you to remain seated as we sing together the hymn, Be Still My Soul. Might this be your prayer today?
O oh, great and loving God, you do know the temptations that we have because you have walked this way with us. You have walked that lonesome valley and know our trials. You know how often we fail to live up to you, who you have called us to be. Help us to see with your light those places that are dark within us where we'd rather not clean out the cobwebs and open the windows and look for the light of your love. Help us to invite you into those places that we might be more receptive to learning who you have called us to be and how you have called us to grow into who you have made us to be. Lord, help us in all those times when we're tempted to believe that we can live without you. Grant us grace and give us peace. Guide our way that we may walk ever more closely with you. And gracious God, show us how to be gracious to others as you are gracious to us. Teach us how to be kind in loving and living out your grace. Lord, show us the ways that we might be an answer to someone else's prayer. We lift before you today all those who are suffering in body and mind and spirit. For those who are in need of your healing touch, might they be restored to wholeness and health. For those who are struggling in difficult situations, Lord, send an answer. Help them to know a sense of your presence and your peace. Might they feel your spirit opening them up to where you are leading them. Lord, we remember those who are grieving. Might they feel your comforting arms, giving them a sense of peace and assurance and the continuation of the spirits of those who've left us. Might we know their love continues with us even though their presence is not here. And Lord, each of us carries concerns in our own hearts for ones that we care and love about, care about and love. We pray that you would help us to lay those things before you, that you might be at work in those places, and help us to lay those down in such a way that we do not take them up again, but trust that you are at work. Lord, we offer this prayer in hope and in trusting assurance that you are our beloved Father, who cares for each of us as your own children. We offer you thanks and praise, and we ask these things in the name of Jesus our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite the ushers to come forward to receive this morning's offering. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your steadfast love and care for us. And out of gratitude for that great love, we offer ourselves, our gifts, and our tithes for your service that others might know of that love and grace. In Jesus' name, amen.
standing as we sing together a declaration of our faith. Great is thy faithfulness. go forth trusting in God's faithfulness, knowing that Jesus was tempted as we are tempted, and knowing that God's light and love forgives all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.